the year 324, Constantine the Great met his last remaining rival, Licinius, just across the Bosporus from the Greek colony of Byzantium, and in the shadow of that ancient city, he won a complete, a shattering victory. At the age of 52, he was now the sole ruler of the Roman Empire. Under his leadership, the empire prospered and regained its strength after the crisis of the 3rd century. The city of Rome had long since ceased to be a practical capital. It was too far from the frontier and too pagan. He decided that the empire needed a new capital. He would later claim, as usual, that he was led by a divine voice to the ancient city of Byzantium, but surely no prophetic voice was needed to pick the site. Nearly a thousand years old, the Greek colony was perfectly situated halfway between the eastern and western frontiers. Possessing a superb deep water harbour, the city could control the lucrative trade routes between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean that brought amber and wood from the far north and oil, grain and spices from the east. The emperor was the master of the civilized world, and he was determined to move heaven and earth to finish his masterpiece. Artisans and resources from the length and breadth of the empire were marshaled for the project, and the city seemed to spring up almost overnight. The city was officially dedicated on May 11, 330, and though Constantine had named it Nova Roma, but it was always known as Constantinople in his honor. While setting out for a campaign against Persia in 337, Constantine fell ill, and waiting for the last possible moment, he was baptized and died on May 22nd. Few rulers in history have had such an impact on history. He had found an empire and a religion fractured and hopelessly divided, and bestowed on both an order that would serve them well. His adoption of Christianity set off a cultural earthquake that began a sweeping and permanent social transformation. Constantine left the empire in a strong position, but soon after his death, cracks would start to re-emerge. From the time of Augustus to Marcus Aurelius, the Romans could handle the barbarian tribes on their border. In the third century, though, that started to change. The barbarians had sustained contact with the organized Romans, and their battlefield tactics changed. As a result, they became better organized, coalescing into tribal confederations that were extremely formidable. Not only were they dangerous opponents, they also enlisted in the legions, and eventually came to dominate them. In the early 5th century, a barbarian named Stilicho came to dominate the West, and he successfully held it together for some time, until the senators in Rome got jealous of his military success and had him killed off. The Senate didn't have long to celebrate, though. With Stilicho gone, there was nobody to defend Italy, and they were defenseless against the merciless Goths. Their leader, Alaric, led them across the Alps and formed his army up before the gates of the empire's ancient capital. The citizens of Rome refused to believe the evidence before their eyes, trusting in the formidable reputation of the city that had ruled the world. In late August of 410, the unthinkable happened. For the first time in 800 years, an invading army entered Rome. For three days, the Goths sacked the Eternal City. For the standards of the day, the sacking wasn't especially brutal, but it had a profound psychological shockwave that reverberated around the empire. Saint Jerome, writing from Bethlehem, put into words the horror that everyone felt. A dreadful rumor has come from the West. My voice sticks in my throat. <laughs> the city which had taken the whole world was taken itself. The moment the Goths were spotted in Italy, the Western Roman Emperor, Honorius, relocated his court to the more defensible Ravenna. However, even in a new city, the emperor could not stop the empire from fracturing. The Visigoths and Franks overran Gaul. Spain flared up in revolt, and Saxon invaders swarmed into Britain. The anxious British wrote to Honorius begging for help, but the answer they received made it all too clear that the Imperium was failing in the West. Look after your own fates. The emperor advised. The imperial armies were everywhere on the retreat, and Britain was abandoned to its long and futile fight against the Saxons. Rome still had the wealth of North Africa, 
But by the time Honorius finally expired of edema of the lungs in 423, the Vandals had wrested most of it from his control. The Eastern government did what it could to help its dying counterpart, but it had its own problems with a terrifying new enemy. Descending from the Central Asian steppe in a wild, undisciplined horde, the Huns came crashing into imperial territory, destroying everything in their path and spreading terror and death wherever they went. Unlike the other peoples the empire dismissively called uncivilized, the Huns were barbarians in every sense of the word. Wearing tunics sewn from the skin of field mice, they never bathed or changed clothes, slept on their horses under the open stars, and ate their food raw. Their leader, Attila, led his Huns into Italy intent on sacking Rome himself. The long absence of emperors from Rome left a power vacuum that no secular leader could fill. More and more of these powers fell into the hands of the only real leader left in the city, the Pope. When Attila arrived, there was no army to meet him, only the lonely figure of Pope Leo, who left on foot to meet Attila in his camp. We don't know what Leo said, but whatever it was, it worked, and Attila turned his army around and left Italy. Attila was soon found dead in his tent after a night of drinking. The death of their great enemy sent the Roman world into wild jubilation, but it did nothing to alleviate the true danger. For the moment, the barbarians were content to stay behind the throne, but how long before they decided to rule on their own? If the emperors didn't break free soon, the empire would dissolve from within into petty barbarian kingdoms. The Western Emperor Valentinian III attempted to escape first. He rashly decided to assassinate his barbarian master, and he carried out the deed personally. However, the barbarian yoke wasn't that easy to cast off, and the next year the barbarian struck back and killed him. Valentinian's widow made the unfortunate decision to appeal to the Vandals for help. They were only too happy to help. They appeared with a large army outside of Rome, and for the third time in four decades, Rome was at the mercy of barbarian armies. The Vandals weren't interested in negotiating, and for two weeks they sacked the city. Although they spared the people, when there was nothing left, they departed from the shattered city with their loot to their northern African capital of Carthage. After the reverses of the past few years, this most recent sack of the city wasn't quite as shocking as the first, but it did convince the watching Eastern court of the dangers of trying to shake off their barbarian masters. It was a lesson that Aspar, the Sarmatian general who currently had Constantinople in his grip, understood. Aspar had his proxy in who he thought was a tame, elderly man named Leo. Leo was a perfect puppet, since he was undistinguished and deferential to Aspar, and he had no sons to follow him on the throne. Aspar had half of the army directly under his command, and so there was little chance the emperor could pose a threat to his authority. To his surprise, he found that Leo did have the ability to lead, and he didn't intend to remain a figurehead for long. Leo was smart enough not to move against his master at once. Assassinating Aspar would only lead to his own untimely death. Leo had to strike at Aspar's true power source, the army. Casting around for a military counterbalance to Aspar, Leo found the perfect man in Zeno. Zeno was the leader of a group called the Isaurians from Anatolia. Zeno traveled to Constantinople and found evidence of Aspar's treason, providing Leo an opportunity to strike at Aspar publicly. Zeno was awarded the hand of the emperor's daughter and a post equal in rank to Aspar. Leo now had the freedom to direct imperial policy. Seeing that the western half of the empire was on the verge of collapse, he launched an ambitious plan to aid it by conquering the Vandal Kingdom in North Africa. Returning North Africa to the empire would go a long way toward restoring the west, while also punishing the Vandals for their sack of Rome. Leo spared no expense in raising this force, he liquidated 130,000 pounds of gold to build a thousand ships and muster an army of 400,000. To command the huge invasion force, Leo chose possibly the worst commander in history. 
His name was Basiliscus. His only qualification was that he was Leo's brother-in-law. Against anyone else, the Vandals would have stood no chance, but Basiliscus managed to wreck his fleet and get his army destroyed. Panicking mid-battle, he left the army to fend for itself and fled to safety in Constantinople. The only silver lining in the debacle is that Aspar, being technically the head of the military, was blamed for the disaster. Seeing his reputation plummet, Leo had him quietly assassinated. Basiliscus was sent into exile. Although Leo had broken free from his barbarian overlords, he didn't enjoy it for long. Three years later, he died of dysentery. The throne passed to his son-in-law, Zeno. Zeno was well-placed to lead the empire. However, he was saddled with atrocious in-laws. Leo's wife, Verina, never accepted the marriage of her daughter to Zeno and did everything in her power to undermine him. Verina, along with her useless brother, Basiliscus, started scheming to place their family on the throne. Although Basiliscus had destroyed his own credibility in the disastrous North African campaign, he was convinced that in time he would still become emperor. The vengeful siblings attracted a disgruntled Isaurian general named Ilus, and the three of them hatched a plan to overthrow Zeno. They waited until the emperor was busy presiding over the games at the Hippodrome. Then Verina sent a frantic message to Zeno to tell him that the people had risen against him. Zeno, mistaking the uproar of the games for the sound of revolt, believed her. Knowing he was unpopular in the city, Zeno didn't stop to double-check if the citizens were rising against him. The terrified emperor fled with the remains of the gold reserve to his native Isauria. The empire was now in Verina's hand. She planned on having her lover, Patricius, crowned immediately. But it turned out that overthrowing an emperor was easier to installing a new one. The army didn't raise a finger to help Zeno, but they wouldn't hand the throne over to someone with no legitimate claim. So the army turned to the one readily available candidate, Basiliscus. Incredibly, the man who almost single-handedly destroyed the military power of the East and doomed the West to destruction, now found himself hailed Emperor of Rome. He soon proved that he was utterly unfit for the position and quickly lost all support in the city. He sent an army to crush Zeno, but the army switched sides and encouraged the emperor to return to Constantinople to reclaim his throne. Basiliscus promised a valiant defense, but there was no one left willing to fight for him. The Senate threw open that gates and the population poured into the streets, cheering Zeno as he entered. Zeno sent Basiliscus to Cappadocia, where he was starved to death. Only two years had passed since Zeno had fled the city but the world had irrevocably changed in his absence. In the moment of Constantinople's weakness, the Western Empire had finally collapsed for good. A barbarian general named Odoacer, growing tired of the charade of puppet emperors, decided to rule Italy in his own right. Smashing his way into Ravenna, where the teenage Romulus Augustulus was cowering, Odoacer decided at the last moment to spare his life choosing instead to send the young emperor into exile. On September 4th, 476, Romulus Augustulus obediently laid down the crown and scepter and went to live with his family in Campania. Though no one thought him important enough to bother recording when or where he died, his abdication marked the end of the Western Roman Empire. It's unlikely that anyone at the time noticed such a watershed moment in history, Barbarian generals overthrowing emperors had become distressingly routine for Roman citizens, and for most inhabitants of the former empire, life on the morning of September 5th was no different than the day before. The civil service and the law courts functioned as they always had. Merchants and artisans continued to travel down the wide Roman roads, and nothing seemed to suggest a sharp break with the past. The only real change was that Odoacer didn't feel like appointing a new emperor, he very sensibly decided that there was no use in going through the bother of ruling through a puppet when he could simply pay lip service to Constantinople and rule in his own right. Sending the Western imperial regalia to the east, along with a letter congratulating Zeno on recovering his throne, Odoacer asked only for permission to rule the West in his name. 
the Eastern Emperor, of course, had no intention of legitimizing a barbarian strongman, but for the moment he was helpless to stop it. Dodging the issue, he let Odoacer continue with the charade of ruling as a surrogate and concentrated on putting his own house in order. The tacit approval from the East had convinced Odoacer that he could do what he pleased without fear of retribution, and the barbarian soon dropped the pretense of being the loyal vassal and began calling himself King of Italy. The imperial armies were too weak to avenge this obvious insult, but the clever emperor saw a way to solve two imperial headaches at the same time. Sending for the Gothic king Theodoric, who was rampaging in the Balkans, Zeno gave him his blessing to lead his entire people, men, women and children, into Italy to rule it in the emperor's name. Within five years, Theodoric had battered Odoacer into submission and brought Italy welcome peace and a remarkably efficient government. He ruled for 33 years, and though he was independent of even the remotest imperial control, to the end of his life, the only face on his coins was that of the Emperor of the East. Zeno never lived to see the triumph of his strategy. He was in declining health and survived just long enough to see his young son and heir die of illness before succumbing to dysentery himself. After such a turbulent reign, many of his subjects couldn't help but remember him with disgust, or at best, ambivalence. But he deserved more than that. Coming to the throne in the blackest of days, he guided the ship of state through the ruptures that brought down the West, and he left the empire stronger than he found it. The empire's foundation may have been shaken, but it had endured and was now ready to regain its strength. Zeno's legacy, however, provided a secure throne to work from, and over the next three decades, the empire experienced a remarkable recovery. Bribery and corruption were rooted out, money was collected more efficiently, and taxes were generally lowered. The memories of the 5th century's turbulence began to fade like a bad dream, and a new generation of Romans began to take up the reins of power. For the first time since Diocletian, the empire was facing no serious military or political threats, and despite the volatility of the past centuries, it hadn't lost a single inch of imperial territory. Brimming with self-confidence, the empire was strong, secure, and ready for explosive growth. It only needed an emperor who was willing to dream.